Fita, the haunting thing. Diana Manning was the very last woman to whom such a thing should have happened, for there was nothing but her, at least psychic or spiritual. She was a matter with a capital M, a sex with a capital S. Dollars rather than since hers of sex, but excuse of passion. Sex dealing entirely with shamelessly with bank accounts, high power racing cars, diamonds, and vintage champagnes. She was lonely. She drove the hearts and purses men. The breath drives a thin sheet of flame. Only her fingernails gave the mark of the East Side Tenement. She was nay Maggie Smith. She had been born and bred. It was uh, there too well kept, too highly polished. Too perfectly manicured. But men did not notice. They seldom looked further than the hair, for which was like a sculptured reddish bronze helmet, for a low, smooth, ivory forehead, and a short, delicately curved nose. Her lips, which were crimson like a fresh sword, wound her eyes, which spoke of wondrous promises, a lie damnably. A life had been melodramatic. From the man's angle to be understood, and not from her own sense, so limely evil. She is beyond the moralizing sense of bad, and of course good. <coughs> there have been death in a trail of the swimming grounds, suicide, ruin, and slime of the footsteps, disgrace to one more than other than one. But she never cared a whit. She was always petting her own for her faults, punching the lives of strangers, who never returned strangers for long. The dagger point of personality, her greed, her evil, men was kept on fluttering around the red, burning candle that was a life, like silly willow flies. Then more deaths, records bought and paid for, all that sort of thing, quite melodramatic, dramatic, incredibly garnishly so. But what will you? Isn't always the woman that pays stage and puppet to contrary? If she does pay, if she is a man who endorses the note, when she reached the house home the upper west street side of this Saturday night, she felt the thing the moment she stepped across the threshold. She felt it shrouded, anonymously vague, but it was there. Very small at first, hidden somewhere, the huge square entrance full, appearing upon her mind. She wondered what it was, and what it might be doing there. She called her handmaid, Anetta, Anetta. She did not call to assure herself. The woman had not afraid, but she exactly was not afraid from first to last. If she had been, she would have switched on the light. But she did not. She left the flat in darkness deliberately. And that, again, was strange, since if at all, she always hated darkness and half-light. A seeping greyish shadow, always wanted and glorified in full, orange bursts of colour. Big, glustering, massive, cool lights. She had just sought, just the sort of complexion. Plaided, you know, smooth, a colour rising, evilly, dawning, huge and tender, never in patches of blurry streaks. Annetta, Annetta, she called again, a mere matter of habit. She relied on respectable middle age, but growing made for ev- everything and ev- for anything and everything that troubled her from wrestling with a cynical, cynical, inquisitive reporter to putting the c- correct quantity of anoma in a spromo celsus. Yes, ma, madam, said the vo- woman's maid, sleepy voice. Has anyone called? No, madam. But, she looked in the corner of the entrance hall, the thing seemed to be clutching, almost a pig lot green cushions at the ottoman there. But the letter, she commenced again. She did not complete the sentence. Somehow it did not make any difference. The thing was there. It did not matter how it got in. I am coming, madame, said the maid. Never mind, go to sleep. I undertrust myself. Good night, Annetta. Good night, madam. (coughs) 
Diana Manning shrugged her shoulders, walked across the entrance hall, put a hand on the doorknob of a boudoir. She said to herself that she would open the door quickly, slide in, and dose it quickly. For she sensed rather she knew the thing tended to follow her. It radiated energy and vigour and determination, a certain kindly de- determination. That, just as for a moment, touched her a sense of awe. For a moment she opened the door, a moment she lay her body slid from the darkness, the entrance hall, the creamy, silky, perfumed darkness of her boudoir. She owed that the thing fluttered in her side. She knew felt it blow over her neck to her face, her breast, like a gust of wind. It even touched her. It touched her now physically. It was the only way to put it. Nor was it afraid, then. On the contrary, she felt rather sorry for the thing that had touched her once more in a sense of awe. Now she since to feel sorry for her new sensation. Since ever before, before all this time and she felt sorry for anything or anybody the result was that because she she began to hate the thing a cold calculating hatred hatred without fear she locked the windows and doors quite instructively a hand brushed a tiny brunette button which controlled the vision currently she did not press it she left the boudoir in darkness well, she was familiar with a very stick of furniture about the place. She knew the exact location, the great sealed crimson or gold Spanish Remembrance Day bed between the window and the fireplace, the big bureau table in the centre of the room, the small one covered with a mass of brick back. Between the two windows, a veil of van running away along the south wall and overlapping towards the fireplace, the three stairs at old angles, the little Tourettes in the northwest coma, the Japanese screen inlaid with ivory outlook, black and jade. Behind, she kept a smaller girl closet chest. She knew the room, every inch of it, and would move about it in spite of the darkness like a cat. The thing on the other hand, whatever it was, would find many pitfalls in the closet up bar. It would try to get rambunctious. The latter were the exact words with which Diana Manning expressed the thought to herself in this very moment of awe and hatred. Remember she had born a bread on the west side. Of course, since these days of sooty, sticky, grimy tenement crystal eyes, she had learned to broaden her eyes and slur her R's and change the sound of gutters from that of racetracks. But somehow she knew the thing wouldn't be more familiar with it at early detection. He landed on the crouch, staring into the darkness. She decided to watch carefully her pounce upon the thing suddenly and to throttle it. For somehow the thing had taken on the suggestion of deliberate personal intention of her aggressive facility, something which felt and hated even suffered yet with no bodily reality. Realization it froze Diana into rigidity. Not a rigidity of fear, but something far worse than fear. By taking a fate of she does not know what. She only knew she must watch then pounce and kill. I have I must have matters out with it, she thought. One of us two the master in this room, uh, it, or I. I can't afford to wait all night. A half past eleven, young bunny ripper. It's calling for me. Again, I thought of Benny Wimple. As she felt the strange, hateful new sensation of awe, blended with pity, the thing was responsible for it. The thing. How she hated it. She clenched the fists until her knuckles stretched white. That. What had the thing to do with Bunny Wimple? And yes, with Bunny Wimple's little bloom. I, green haired wife, the bride, whom Diana cut the fault in mid air and tossed it aside. She was a soiled love. She moved more carefully than ever, her breath came into short secreto bursts, her body tense and strained, her mind rigid. She tried to close her mind. She did not want the thing to peep in, to, in, in upon it. 
For right then she knew she did not need no feel no guess. She knew that she the thing as trick of as fanning descending at will. It made her angry, she did not consider it fair. But it gave to the thing the advantage of suddenly shrinking to the size of the pinpoint and hiding the knob not of the turns of a rug, which covered the floor and immediately afterwards bloating to monstrous size like a balloon and floating round the solid ceiling like an immense soap bottle. Hanging there, looking down on that strange, hateful, rather kindly determination. Bunny Wibble's wife, she thought again. I saw her again yesterday. A silly little fool recognised me. How she should have spoken to me. I'd have given her the chance, spoken to me as she woke me. Asking to give me her back her husband love. Love? My from the words caressed it. More carefully something fertile and soft and native. Naive and laughable. Like a book ball or cotton or tiny kitten. The next moment she whipped aside oh, hard wheel. She sat up straight for foaming of the world. The thing which a second earlier had been the pinpoint sitting the guided edge of Ceres Vars bloated and stretched, triangularly leaped up, appeared to float, leaped again across the ceiling, as if trying to jerk away from the cross beams. Then, just as suddenly as he dropped to the floor, he lay there, roaring with laughter. Dinah did not know they hear the laughter. She knew it. She, fe- she felt it. She knew it. Too, she knew exactly where it was. Between a large bubble table and the divan, she left it and choked it while well, it lay there helpless from merriment. She jumped to full of crouch. Her fingers spread like a crap's cause. Till you get you, you thing, said the words out loud. I'll get you. I'll get you. A voice rose in a shrill, terroring shriek. Step by step, she approached the divan. Oh, get you, get you, madame, madame, did, did you call me? It was a maid's voice coming from the hall. No, no, go to bed, Annette, go to bed, do you hear me? said the, as the maid rattled the door knob. I don't want to be served. I beg your pardon, madame, Annette coughed discreetly. I don't know that, I didn't know any, that anyone in... Thought you had come home alone. I go to bed at once, down the street. And the ma- ma- prince pattering away. He found the couch panting. She was a tearing rage. She felt sure. If she had done for the maid, she would pounce upon the thing. While it lay there on the floor, roaring with laughter. Then the laughter died out. And the thing had got away. It shrunk into a tiny butterfly. That's how Dinah felt it. Which, it, which was beating its wings. Against the brass rod of potteries. But his fluttering rather helplessly blindly. He had lost some of his energy and vigour. Again, Diana felt sorry and correspondingly. A hatred grew in a determination. I'll get you, you. She waited until her breath came. More evenly, Rose walked noiselessly to the potteries and rustled with them. A thing was startled, Diana. Could feel the tiny wings flutter and beat. She could hear its terrible, straining effort to bloat a huge soap bubble, and not succeeding to shrink into a pinpoint. But well, something was making it impossible, and Diana knew what it was. The fact that one of the hidden block cells of her brain, the fault of Diana, but these wimples, silly little fool, a golden haired wife, had taken firm root. Refused to budge. So Dana felt kept at fault. She nursed it, it seemed a light bait. She thrust it forward. She spoke out loud, her face raised up by the butteries. So you know, fall of a golden bride head bride, she added out of a subconscious violation. Silly bunny, she catched the spoken words seriously, as a noisy boy speaks to a cat. Before she catches her and twinks her tail, the thing was about to fall into the trap. For a second it hovered, and the brass rod seemed to wait expectant, undecided. <coughs> then it came down to a few inches, it fluttered, within reach of Diana's outstretched hand. Then she closed her hand suddenly, viciously, victoriously. It's waving away again, breathlessly, frightened but unharmed. It blew into the centre of the room. It made a renewed, terrible effort to bloat into the room. This time it succeeded, partly. 
You do not fe- feel exactly what shape it assumed. There's something ambitious, flabby, covered in all over, soft bumps, and very beastly. He followed more time than ever. The thing tried to leap into the air. It needed. Honey nearly succeeded when Diana, with quick presence of mind, fought again of Bunny Whipple. Bunny Whipple's silly, golden haired wife. He asked me to give her back Bunny's love. His love, God, does a silly little fool think that Bunny loves me? She called that love? This time he's Diana who burst into a roar of laughter. The thing stood still and listened, his head cocked on one side. Stupid, ridiculous, foolish. And when Diana neared it, they tried to fly, to hover, to swing in midair. All it succeeded in doing was to move swiftly about the room, just an inch or two away from the woman's groping fingers. Diana laughed again. She knew the thing, lost its ferocity of flying. You'd not be able to escape her for long, with the chances all in her favour. For the world while was cluttered with furniture, she knew the location of every piece. The thing would lose itself, stumble, fall. And then, wait, you must wait. She whispered the thing following, backing away from the centre of the rail, towards the carved Chinese screen. She followed step by step, her fingers groping, clawing, a lust the hunter in her eyes, in her heart. Off what are you? She quickly considered to throttle is to kill. She had to measure her own strength exactly about against the thing's strength of resistance. That would be hard. The thing was not physical. It had no body. She was sure to have a heart. She could stab the heart. A heart. She picked the bubble tubble, the jeweled Cassinian dagger, which she admired the day before, the little shop of legs and venue, which Bunny had given to her. As some very foolish mark, quite typical of him, she remembered, I wish to God you'd kill yourself with it. Get out of my life. Keep leave me in peace. Me and Lottie. Lottie was a silly golden home wife. But with a dagger in hand, Dinah took up the chase again. But when the dagger in hand, Diana took up the chase again. She was disappointed, for the thing seemed to familiar with the room as herself. He avoided sliding rugs, sharp covered blue tables, turrets and chairs, placed at odd angles. He never as much as grazed a single one of those many brittle bits of fake back. Once he chuckled, his faintly amused at something. But Diana did not give her heart. She made up mind she was a hard woman, a soul a blending of diamond, a fire kit still. I'll get you, she thought, to a new, better way she would corner the thing. Again she advanced slowly, cautiously, step by step, driving the thing between before her, a whip for the room, always keeping it uttermost in mind the fault of Bunny Whipple, and the silly fall of a golden haired wife. The fault was paralyzing the thing, facility of bloating, the choking of flying. The end came very suddenly. Watching a chance she had a thing cornered, straight up against the inner entry on his screen. It tried to shrink, to bloat, to fly, to get away, but then had timed her action. The click of a second. She brought the dagger down with all her strength. The thing crumbled. It gave. It was not. It was just a smart pain, crimson smear. A very soft voice from as far, starry, very distance. You have killed me, Diana. Killed? Whom? Who are you? The evil in your soul, Diana. The evil. There's something which had been consumed. Seemed to turn fluid and alive and golden. So it rose in a state that was too calm to be ecstasy. Next morning, Bunny Wimple's silly, blue-eyed, golden-eyed wife was sitting across from her husband at breakfast. Her he was white and haggard and shaky. She looked at him, pity in her eyes. Have you seen the morning paper, Bunny? She asked. No, don't want to. What a scandal about me, I guess. He read the words of her savagely. I mean, that... 
That woman, she faltered. But no money. All right. What about her? She was found dead last night by her maid. She stabbed herself through the heart with Sidney Becker. The papers say that a smile was on her face. A smile. A happy, sweet smile. As if you beat the star and read the reporter's lyric outposts out loud. As if death had brought her happiness and salvation, a deep, calm, glorious fulfilment. Bunny Whipple did not reply. He stared at his coffee cup. Very suddenly he looked up. His wife had risen and walked around the table and forward towards him. She put her slim white hands on his shoulders, with tears in her eyes, tears and trembling question. She drew him to her and kissed her.